This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. On now, and it's a great privilege to introduce my, my colleague, eminent historian and uh, my friend, Ludmilla Jordanova, who is Professor of Modern History and Director of the Centre for Visual Arts and Cultures at Durham University. She has single-handedly reinvigorated public engagement in history uh, at Durham. She is a celebrated author of History in Practice, now going into yet another edition, and more recently, um, The Look of the Past. Uh, She's a trustee of the Science Museum Group, and she is our chair for the panel judging our new prize in public history. So it's a very great pleasure to welcome Ludmilla to provoke us into thinking deeper (laughs) about public history before lunch. Jo, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I just wanted to explain what I'm I'm doing here. So I think the talks we've had so far have been really inspiring. Um, And thank you to all the speakers, and I know we'll have more um, this afternoon. And obviously we've come together here because public history is something we care about or we practice. But it seems to me in the wider world, we cannot take that support for granted. So I'm very concerned that we have, as it were, the paragraph up our sleeves that we can present public history to people who perhaps are skeptical or even downright hostile or think of it as not, quote, proper history. So that's what I am trying to to address here. So as has already been acknowledged, the term public history is distinctly tricky by virtue of its range of meanings and the diverse reactions it elicits. Everyone is familiar with E.P. Thompson's phrase about rescuing the working class from the condescension of posterity in his The Making of the English Working Class, published in 1963. Now, recent weeks have seen Neil Ferguson condescend to Jane Smiley, a historical novelist, on Radio 4 Start the Week, and her repost in The Guardian of the 17th of October. And I have brought a copy of this if you'd like to pass it round. Um, I would like it back. Um, uh, It's a precious document. (laughs) Now, for, for Ferguson, fiction cannot be history in any meaningful sense. For Smiley, it can. For Ferguson, history is research intensive. But so is Smiley's work, she protested. So condescension is common in the face of some forms of public history, as words like popularizer can easily suggest. And so does the assumption that writing for wider audiences is somehow diluting not just the past, but the scholarship of those who do so. There are some notable exceptions, of course, and I think the books by and reactions to Christopher Clarke and Adam Tooze are very interesting examples. And I think it will be worth examining these cases to see what sets them apart. But in the Ferguson Smiley case, there is an all too familiar hierarchy of historical genre. Now I consider historical fiction to be a major form of public history. Hence this episode is of considerable interest for our discussions today. It would take far longer than I have this morning to disentangle the disagreements, the misunderstandings, and the strong feelings involved. But I take the Smiley Ferguson encounter to be a telling example of some of the difficulties that arise about talking about history in public. And whether we like or sympathize with one or other side, I think is hardly the point. I happen to feel that novelists can also be historians. If in ways we want to specify case by case, book by book, just as we would with any historical genre. All genre, like the works within them, invite such careful analysis. Now, I think there are three issues arising from Ferguson's condescension to Smiley that we may want to consider briefly today. The first and perhaps most obvious is the forms of paring down that may be involved in presenting accounts of the past to non-specialists. So, for example, accounts may be deemed simplified if they do not include footnotes and bibliographies, since readers are relying on a persuasive narrative without having the option to assess for themselves the kinds of mediation necessarily involved. Although some novels do have footnotes, 
On the whole, general readers do not want a massive scholarly apparatus, and many non-fiction trade books have a rather light supporting structure at the publisher's request. The problem becomes more acute with forms of representation where the authority behind any claims may be unclear, exhibitions, some websites, TV and film, for instance. And Jane Smiley doesn't parade the depth of her research, so it is difficult to assess it in conventional ways. The second issue concerns the role of the imagination, and I'm quoting now from Jane Smiley. I have to use my imagination to make connections, to evoke feelings, to show patterns, to build a logical structure, she insists. She continues, but then my historian colleague must do the same. <laughs> now, it is unclear to me precisely what Ferguson's position is on the role of the imagination in historical practice. But it is evident that most forms of public history, however we define the term, involve not only the imagination, but forms of imaginative collusion. That is, audiences actively participate in some way. And I think it's worth reflecting on such collusions, no matter what kind of history one practices, or indeed, no matter what kind of history one consumes. The third issue, revolves around the language we use to analyze historical practice. In the radio program, Smiley characterized history in terms of events. So she said to Ferguson, oh, but history is about events. And this allowed Ferguson to come right back at her with a riposte. It's about much more than this, he insisted. But without defining their terms, history, events, and so on, and some philosophical discussion, what are broadcasters supposed to do? Smiley was reaching for a quick way of making a point, and I think the term tripped her up. So by using events, she gave Ferguson an entry into keeping her in a subordinate position. So I, th so I wanted to give some more examples of this. Truth is, I think, another such term, and so, of course, this fact. And then we have the problem of history as well. Now, Smiley actually has a doctorate. She's a Pulitzer Prize winner, and she has published non-fiction works. But she is not, as it were, a historiographer. And would it be appropriate in any case, even assuming she was, to go into these matters on Radio 4 or in The Guardian? So common sense and often quite reductionist meanings of such terms, I think, do inhibit public discussion because they channel it into simple polarities. Now, I'm not sure what the solution is here, but one conclusion might be that it is the role of public history as a field to address this difficulty. Running through all these points, however, are questions about hierarchies, and especially hierarchies of knowledge. All scholars benefit from engaging with them. So my main provocation consists of simply this. Public history, both the field and the range of practices, history and public, crystallizes many of the central issues of historical practice, and hence is relevant to all historians as well as to others, and should not be seen just as a new specialism, and accordingly only for a select new group of specialists, since this stance can easily tip into a sense that other people or other historians don't have to bother with it. We've got people who do that as a rule. So as historians, as citizens, public history touches us directly, if in a multitude of intricate ways that I think are rather difficult to entangle. Jane Smiley suggests that we think of genre not as a hierarchy, but as a flower, I'm quoting her now, a flower bouquet with different colors, scents, and forms. And I can see that this is a delightful simile, but social and political realities demand that we are thinking all the time about the quality of knowledge and the broad implications of historical claims, topics that must also be central to public history insofar as it claims to be an academic field. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to what I see as an irony here. On one reading, much public history is under-conceptualized. 
For instance, popular history may concentrate on lists of key facts, often surprising or, uh, or piquant in some way. And this is particularly uh, common in the, in the new flourishing of history magazines. So if you look at magazines like All About History or History Revealed, I think it's really important <coughs> that people like us read those magazines and think about what they mean. And of course, such formats, you know, 10 things you never knew about the history of torture, um, <laughs> such formats reinforce common beliefs about facts and dates lying at the heart of history. So I'm bemoaning a separation of public history from other parts of the discipline. Yet at the other end of the spectrum, so to speak, we have had another field emerging over just the same period. History and theory, historiography, historical theory, however we like to put it. And these two more or less simultaneous changes show how easy it is for the discipline of history to fragment. And for this to happen in ways that generally affirm rather than challenge existing intellectual hierarchies, which generally tend to rate refined theoretical perspectives more highly than assemblages of information. And of course, it's a further irony that uh, many historical websites consist of and celebrate just such assemblages. So there was a question earlier about digital history, which I regard as absolutely fundamental. And maybe another year we might focus on this question of digital history and, and public history. So uh, what I've been doing is trying to put in the most direct way possible some of the issues that public history raises. And I just want to give you a little bit of context of where I'm coming from in, in these remarks. So I first became aware of the phrase public history in the 1990s, and that was when I was preparing the first edition of History in Practice, and I asked all the historians I interviewed in order to get a more rounded view of the discipline what they understood by public history, and most of them said they had no idea what it meant. Now I decided to devote a whole chapter to the topic because I cannot see how any practicing historian can responsibly ignore the ways in which their field is alive in the world beyond educational institutions. And this is why my main point today is that public history is about history in its broadest sense, and that consequently there are costs to treating it as a specialist field more about, quote, popularization than about, quote, real history. Now, the vast majority of practicing historians do now have some idea about what history public history refers to, even if there are many different ways of construing it. There are courses and po posts and courses, journals and textbooks. Hence, we might assume that somehow now public history has arrived. However, I think this is only a partial account, and I suggest that we need to adopt a more critical perspective. And this is partly because, as I hope I've already shown, the meanings of public history are both unclear and contested. And one obvious fissure here is between those who believe that it should be generated through grassroots activity and those for whom it should be practiced by professionals. Now, my Ferguson Smiley example, of course, does not address the grassroots question, since novelists too tend to be professionals, even if in Ferguson's view, professionals of lower rank than himself. Um, and as it happens, I don't see any obvious professional amateur polarity in any case, advocating forms of public history from below and stressing the need for trained historians to be involved are not wholly incompatible positions. It's rather wonderful. We just had two papers demonstrating this. So a crowdsourced exhibition can nevertheless be curated by a museum professional. And I wanted to draw your attention to a particularly interesting example, which is in Halifax. Um, and it's an exhibition called For King and Country and it's about the First World War. But one thing that's rather interesting about it is that it, not only does it use crowdsourcing, but it actually talks in the exhibition about how it uses crowdsourcing. So it actually builds in a measure of reflection into the exhibition itself. And of course, we know that authoritative websites are made possible by volunteers. So the Clergy of the Church of England database is an interesting example of this. But I don't want to deny that there are important political issues here. If we think about the activities associated with Ruskin College Oxford as an example, uh, it's clear that these are much more bottom-up 
than many of the forms of public history in the USA and Canada, where the field is considerably more professionalized. And of course, the Ruskin emphasize, emphasis is indeed itself a political position. But I wonder whether we should ask ourselves the question, why should public history be a separate delineated field at all? Now, you might think this a curious question, um, but I, I indulge me for a moment, please. And I think there are two rather different ways of thinking about this question. The first follows patterns of professionalization and of the deployment of historical expertise in public life, which in a world that places great emphasis on structured occupations, for formal qualifications, and the recognition of specialized knowledge is likely to, be, to result in a new field with all the paraphernalia that goes with it. As we know, with ever more pressure on jobs related to history since the Second World War, these phenomena help people build careers, while institutions and organizations assist with interactions with pre-existing structures, such as legal systems. So if you're testifying in a court of law and you can say, I come from public history and these are my credentials, presumably it's a kind of facilitator. Now, this pattern is so common that it will be surprising to find any field especially if it made came claims to public value not following it. So in a sense what I'm saying is it's overdetermined that there would be a field called public history. But since historians study just these shifts, I think it's helpful for us to be aware of them in our own lives and settings and to use our own understandings of professionalization in a sort of critical oversight way, which is what one of the things I'm advocating. Now, the second way of reflecting on public history as a, as a field, or why should there be a field, is, I think, rather different. It recognizes that public history refers to highly diverse phenomena, and that it is these phenomena with their complex public status that invite our attention. <coughs> Such complexities do require skills, insights, and knowledge that are, to some degree, specialized. And this line of thought might de be developed further to stress the activities that are involved with making history public, in which we might well be participants rather than observers. So an example of this would be writing panels, which was just referred to, which is a very particular skill, and I think we shouldn't pretend that it isn't. I think writing panels and labels for exhibition is the hardest kind of writing you ever do. Um, now, many is academic historians have little idea how museums work. And this leads to frustrations on the part of museum professionals when largely because of the impact agenda, they are expected to conjure up exhibitions for nothing and in a short period of time. Now, I think this point has implications for the practice of history and certainly for forms of education, which are now building in relevant <coughs> forms of training, especially at doctoral level. Now, arguably, making and responding to public history has become, or is becoming, integral to our professional lives. But as, I've, uh, as I have already suggested, public history is also central to our lives as citizens. And perhaps we can also use our role, our role as consumers of public culture more fully. So on these kinds of arguments, having a domain called public history could help us think through these issues as well as help us to practice history more energetically, openly, and in more diverse forms. Now, I think it's important to accept that there cannot be any stability when it comes to what is meant by public. Its generative qualities come from its richness, and I think it's better to embrace this rather than bemoan the existence of ambiguity. When I told one of my colleagues at Durham that I was interested in public history, he responded, I didn't know there was any other kind. Now, I was initially flummoxed by this comment, and indeed I slightly read it as be him being critical of me, which I think is not at all the case. But the more I thought about his comment, the more interesting I thought it was. So what would private history look like if we take a term commonly thought to be the opposite of public? When we publish, we enter a public realm. And can there really be watertight distinctions between history by and for the public and history produced in and for academic settings? And I think this is what makes the example of someone like Christopher Clarke 
but also Adam Tooze are so interesting because I think no one doubts their sort of really quite amazing status, in my view, fully justified intellectual status that such people have. But they are read incredibly widely. And if you go in, to Germany in museums, you find Chris Block, Clark's books in museum shops everywhere. Nevertheless, the heterogeneity of what falls under at least some definitions of public history should give us pause for thought. There are many significances, significant differences between, say, war memorials that were designed to remind future generations of the conflict in question and of those who lost their lives to provide a focus for survivors and an exhibition designed to provide visitors with historical understanding of that very same war. So I, I put my hand up and plead slightly guilty, certainly in earlier editions of History and Practice, and saying both of those are public history, but they are in very, obviously, in very significant ways different. Now, one possible way of tackling this difference is to consider the level of historical focus involved. Buildings, squares, street names, and so on are largely out of focus, brought sharply into focus when threatened in some way or changed in a controversial manner. A paying exhibition, by contrast, will be in focus for visitors who have chosen to engage with it, although what they may, quote, learn in the process is likely to be highly variable. Another way um, is to take what we might think of as boundary cases. So costume drama, historical fiction, and art exhibitions would all be examples. So what I'm inviting us to do is to take all these forms seriously, whether they're in or out of focus, precisely because they help us focus on questions such as the nature of historical imagination, the representation of moral complexities in the past, and forms of identification with people, places, and processes in earlier times. And I'd like, you to, to, I'd like to note that those things it helps us focus on are just the sort of questions that actually concern scholars with a theoretical bent, who might not necessarily be persuaded that public history is a, an important field. And there really hasn't been time, but of those ones, I actually think the question of moral complexity is by far the most important, and how we can have satisfying exhibitions that don't fall into simplistic hero and villain mode. But again, that's something for another time. So nearly at the end. So I want to end with a paradox. Public history in all its senses stands for the ways the, the, the for, sorry, I think I've got a typo in my thing, so let me just read, I, I apologize. So public history in all its senses stands for the ways in which the past is mediated and for the continual need to reflect critically on those ways. Accordingly, it is central to the discipline and to citizenship. It must not be condescended to. Yet to engage with it fully, it is necessary to have a certain toolkit which brings together, I'd like to suggest, sympathy, knowledge, experience, and reflection. As a field, public history can help to assemble, refine, and refresh these tools. I have argued that the ranking mentality is unhelpful, perhaps it is even pernicious. But in saying this, I am not inviting a thousand flowers to bloom. On the contrary, I am suggesting that we get out there and engage with the diverse practices of public history. There is much to engage with, and some of it I'd like to suggest to you is deeply worrying. And the example I'd like to give is the ways in which popular history magazines sensationalize past violence. So my reference to torture was not plucked out of the air, it refers to a specific spread in one of these magazines which laid out torture instruments across the world. And I think there is something paradoxical in here about the kind of sensationalizing of public culture and what we're trying to do, which is to dismantle that. And I, I, I suppose what I'm trying to think about is, is how we might do this. So my conclusion is that public history in its fullest sense enjoys all of us to think and to practice public history or to practice history more openly and more thoughtfully. Thank you.